But I said, if you, I promise you, if you keep doing it, you won't be around five more. And so far, he's not resting very much now. You also uh, came out against Ric Flair for complaining about the fans using insider terms. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I found that to be the most ludicrous thing that this eagle big fucking nose saggy son of a bitch could ever say. I say that because if Ric Flair is opening his mouth, I feel like he's lying. He's kind of like D Dusty Rose, baby. Let's go to the pay win the baby. If Dusty's talking to you, he's lying. That's the way I feel. That's my. That's the view of one man. That's one man's opinion. Anyway, Flair goes over to England, I guess, or somewhere, and he's doing an interview, and one of the interviewers spoke to him about something, about talking out of school or some kayfabe uh, fact or something, and he got really upset that... that that shouldn't be used by the fans. That shouldn't be used by the news media. You shouldn't say these things. Has he been living in a fucking cave for the last 20 years? This is the electronic age. It's the age of cell phones that you can take a picture with and email it right away to somebody. It's the age of the internet. It's the electronic information age. Everyone knows everything about this business, Rick. Don't you understand? You yourself. You put your own 130-pound bag of bones son on television, he looked like a sack of shit. You put him on television, don't you think that smartened up the whole world? Don't you think that was something you probably shouldn't have done? Don't you think you should have probably kayfabe that? Well, listen, son, stay in the back. You're not ready to go out here yet. But you did it. But now when some reporter or someone like you, Rob, asked me some revealing inside information, I'm supposed to get really pissed off at you now and say, this is all wrong, you shouldn't be doing this, and this is, the, this is the things we need to protect. Listen, you lost your protection a long time ago. Woo! <laughs> so you, you obviously you think it's okay for fans to use those terms, so. I, I have no problem with it because the promoters themselves, Vince McMahon himself went to the state legislature and let the state of New Jersey know that everything we do is theatrical. That we're like a, th a traveling theatrical play. Well, if the promoter can go do that, or if a promoter books a match, here's what I say. The wrestlers don't smarten anybody up. The promoters do. The promoter books a match. He books a match with the two worst dog shit people in the locker room that have the worst match that smartens up everyone because they can't even wrestle, they don't even know anything, but yet when you, when I have to go out there with somebody, or say a Ric Flair goes out with somebody, then we're supposed to do a match that makes the people believe now because these people just made everybody not believe. So the promoters did it and they're booking. Then back to Flair, he goes out, he does the same match every night for 25 years. He flips over the top, he runs down, he climbs up, they slam him off, Every match, every night. And I said this five years ago. And now he picks on Bret Hart. He said Bret Hart was one-dimensional. Bret Hart didn't draw. And then I see an interview where Bret says the same thing. Flair does the same match every night. And then not so long ago I saw where Ole Anderson's put a book out. And Ole's the booker was and a, a pretty good wrestler from Minnesota and down in the Carolinas and drew very well and was a booker down there. And he said Flair had the same match every night. Flair couldn't wrestle that same match every night. Still did this. And then Jerry Lawler says the same thing. I saw an interview with Lawler that he had done with, with the Pro Wrestling Torch about five years ago, five or six years ago, and he said the same thing. He said, Ric Flair came to Memphis and almost killed the territory, almost killed the town because he did those same goofy bumps that he'd been doing on cable TV. But Ole Anderson says in his book, in a statement, he said, uh, apparently he said, the only reason Ric Flair got the world's championship the first time was because he wanted him to have it. Ole wanted him to have the world's championship, and they said, why? He said, because that'll get him out of the territory. He'll be somewhere else where he can't ruin this place for us. So there's your Ric Flair for you. Woo! Where are we partying tonight, Arn? Woo! Speaking of that, my next question goes right into that. Uh, you wrote on your website that if Arn Anderson didn't party so much with Ric Flair, that he wouldn't have needed rehab. <laughs> was that said to get heat or were you serious? I, I was pretty serious about that. I, I feel like that, that Arn, Arn fell in with Flair back in the old southeastern wrestling days down in Pensacola and Mobile. They brought Flair in right after Arn started. And they assigned Arn as a young guy. Arn and Pee Wee Anderson. Pee Wee Anderson's not around anymore. Arn and Pee Wee had the car and they were young kids and they said, Rick Flair's coming in for a week. 
we'd like for you to drive him to the towns because they furnish the transportation for the world's champion. So that's how Arne and Flair and Pee Wee Anderson got together. And after that week, within another two weeks or so, or shortly after that, Arne and Pee Wee both left. They went to the Carolinas and then Arne became, he was Marty Lundy there. He became one of the Anderson younger brothers. And, and that's the story with him. But for all these years, he's been friends with Flair. Nothing wrong with being friends with somebody. The only problem I have is that everyone knocked Beefcake. Oh, if it wasn't for Hogan, Beefcake wouldn't be there. If it wasn't for Hogan, uh, Beefcake would be this. Beefcake wouldn't. Well, if it wasn't for Ric Flair, Arn Anderson would never be Arn Anderson. So you see, when when you say when you make a statement like that, that some this guy's okay because he's got his head so far up this guy's ass, but that's okay. But this guy's not okay because he's a childhood friend with someone and they grew up since they were four years old together and they did everything together for their whole life, but now he's a bad, he's, this guy's a bad guy. So I, I still think, I, I would hope that Ric Flair would, you know, all your money, Rick, I would hope you paid for Arn's uh, rehab. I hope he didn't make the poor guy pay for it himself, but for a guy to get into rehab, uh, if it helped him, fine, that's good, it's good for Arn. I've never had any issues with him. Uh, but he was, I mean, everybody's got a beefcake. You know, Scott Hall is uh, Kevin Nash's beefcake. Uh, uh, Sean, uh, Hunter Hearst Hemsley, Hunter was uh, Sean's beefcake. And, and uh, gosh, it, the list goes on and on of guys who have beefcakes. So let's don't knock beefcake. You know what beefcake was, right? Uh, it was a gay porno guy, right, or something? Yeah, it was a gay, uh, 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 gay I think it's a gay magazine. It might still be around. Out on the West Coast, San Francisco, the name of the magazine was Beefcake. And, and, and you know, in, in that world, I guess, you know, oh, you brute, he's a brute. So Brutus Beefcakes. And there's no name in the WWE that they give to some, that they, they give to someone that doesn't have some kind of a side meaning to it, whether it be the narcissist or the Prince Albert, you know, with the, the, the uh, the piercings of the of the body. The, the Prince Albert is a piercing of a special part of the body that uh, is different from the ones this print. This guy, A Train, he's a good kid. I, I hope he didn't pierce himself there. <laughs> what are your thoughts on uh, Arn and Flair's people and workers? Arn was uh, uh, very, very good. I, I, I give seminars to young wrestling students, and, and just a few days ago I, did, I had one. And I told the students if they want to see how a really good heel tag team works, watch Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard. They were probably the, the, one of the one of the top heel tag teams for their era. Uh, fantastic, the way they did stuff and the bumps they took and the way that they they excited the crowd and fed the baby face for the comeback and took the bumps and and, and I mentioned that and I've got no issues. Like I said, no issues. Arn with Flair and his work, he's accomplished a lot of great things and. And he is a show business person, you know, the robes, the hair, the interviews, great interviewer, can do a great interview, but to, he's redundant in his matches, that's all. But normally, the world, I found this out. Most world's champions would put a match together that worked for them, that they could do no matter where they went. The only ones, the one that I saw that I thought could adapt to anyone was Harley Race. Harley Race didn't put his own his match together and say here's how we'll do it and this this and this Harley Race would actually go out and wrestle a different match every night according to the guy he was wrestling where some of the other world's champions they just had a token match they went out and did the same thing night after night because they were traveling from city to city where the television didn't bleed over and you didn't know that he took that same flip over bump every night S somewhere Rick you haven't understood that you've taken that same bump on cable television for 20 years and you're still trying to do it. Change the bump. Do something else. What was your reaction, I guess, when you heard about the uh, sexual harassment lawsuit filed against Ric Flair and the other guys on that? Uh... The flight from hell. Yeah. Where they all got, where Ric Flair stood naked, took his robe and opened it up. Uh, until the, until the, the facts, the whole facts come out, we won't really know what really happened, but that's normal when you put these guys on a charter flight of something we didn't have. We didn't have the luxury of a charter flight with an open bar. If you're that stupid to put these guys on a charter flight with an open bar, then you're asking for trouble. And how the FAA 
did not come down on Vince McMahon or that charter flight company. I do not know because charter flights are not exempt from FAA standards of where you don't interfere or interrupt a flight. And then you got Kurt Henning who's blown himself away with cocaine now. He's gone and he was on the plane and he was trying to take down Brock Lesnar and Brock Lesnar's gone now. And they were gonna bump the door and almost knock the door open on the plane at 30,000 feet. Just unbelievable acting. They, they, they act like school children. There's nothing wrong with having a few drinks, but cut the bar off. You can't have an open bar. It's so like I said, they had the luxury of a charter flight. By God, they should have been sitting back in 38C near the shitter on a regular commercial flight, and their asses would have been locked up and put away forever. And that's how I feel about it. Because I have a daughter myself, and a lot of people out here, there's going to be a lot of girls watch this. There's going to be a lot of people sitting down moms and dads that watch. It's going to be some, some fellas that watch. You might have a sister, a daughter, a mother, a grandmother. How would you feel if your female family member was just trying to do her job on an airplane and some motherfuckers is out there getting naked, swinging their dicks around? Now, come on. That's bullshit. That's how I feel about it. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like that kind of stuff. I feel like if I'm going to be the honky-tonk man, I'm going to be him when I'm doing an interview similar to this, or when I'm, when I have to, I don't have to be in character right now. I can be myself. And that's what I like to be. The only time I need to be the honky-tonk man is when I'm selling tickets to somebody. And you're not selling tickets on a goddamn airplane to anybody. All you're doing is playing, you, what you were doing was playing around with the boys. Well, there was women on the flight. There was girls that work in the company. This thing's not gonna be over. It could, it could go into the millions. It really could. Uh, sexual harassment won't be a lot of money, but the, the repercussions from it, why is Flair still there? They should have fired him. They should have fired all those people involved, got them out of the company. Once again, when you say, how do you go to your shareholders, your stockholders who buy stock in your company and go, well, we just had a terrible incident that might cost us millions. What happened? Well, some of our players did lewd activities, did all kind of nonsense on an airplane. If that was in the NFL, Major League Baseball, National Hockey League, NBA, I can promise you, if they were players in Phoenix and Jerry Coangelo is the head guy there, you don't get in trouble in Phoenix. He fires your ass. You are gone, buddy. I don't care. If, you, if you're down the street and you get picked up, DWI, you're gone. He does, he, he's one guy that doesn't put up with that. George Steinbrenner probably wouldn't put up with it. It's just something you don't do in a company, especially in a publicly traded company. You try to have your employees do right.